Holger, hey, how are you doing? I'm all right. Hi, Andy. Thank you very much for joining us. We're starting our films by asking contributors just to introduce themselves and give us an overview of their work. So would you mind doing that, please? Sure. Um, my name is Holger Seim. I'm, uh, uh, I teach at the University of Toronto, um, and I'm a theatre historian. Um, I work on both the... And I'm mainly a Shakespearean, um, which is a, an awfully narrow... Uh, focus to have, but I, I mainly work on the, the theatre of Shakespeare's time and uh, 20th century stagings of, of, of Shakespeare. And recently, uh, one of the things I've been particularly interested in is, is space and the sort of, mm. um, well, in, the, in, in, in contemporary settings or in 20th century settings, the sort of repurposing of old spaces mm and old texts to create new theatrical art. Um, and in, in Shakespeare's own time, I'm, I'm really interested, interested in the way that, um, well, especially archeological finds have really forced us to rethink um, what we thought we knew about um, the spaces that Shakespeare's um, actors used and mm -hmm. the way that the, the, the spaces those plays were written for. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yep, that's what I've been, that's, that's what I do. Great. And that's a nice cue for what I think the film is going to focus on today, which is thinking about responding to very recent archaeological discoveries. Before we do that, though, I'm not going to let you get away with describing yourself as awfully narrow, um, both for the benefit of our listeners, but also for the benefit of you. Um, whenever fellow scholars talk about your work, they always express astonishment at the dynamic quality um, with, which you, with which you unite these, you know, um, Scholars do tend to focus on theatre history, uh, plays as literary things, um, historical and contemporary. I'm not saying everyone only looks at one of those things, but you are pretty extraordinary, I think, in the way you're able to move between those, those worlds. And your description of 20th century and, late, and 21st century repurposing of old spaces and texts to make new art, that's also a really good definition, I think, of how an early modern person might talk about their work. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. Yeah, it's sort of a funny thing, you know. I think I think we think of we think of um, innovation in in the arts as in a in in a sort of in a way that people used to talk about modernism as the make it new thing, right? That that's how that's how avant garde's work historically. And I'm I'm increasingly interested in the way that that's not actually true, in in, in the way that in the way that, especially in an art form like theatre that depends so much on, on spatial preconditions, mm -hmm. um, where that, that um, using things you already have in yeah. order to then make something new um, is actually, I think, a pretty central element of how theatre has always been made. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, I think that's just as true in, in like sort of the high, high modernist avant-garde, which is one of my current focuses. Like I spend a lot of my time thinking about 1920s Berlin um, and, um, and, 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 and how, how theatre also worked in Shakespeare's time. And yeah. I think this is something we'll, we'll come back to with, with um, the way that theatres were built and so on and the way mm. they sort of strangely change and don't change. Yes, and you define theatre there in terms of its spatial preconditions. And, you know, one of the problems that perhaps we both have with the way scholars and teachers and students can often think about plays is they think of theatre in terms of textual preconditions. Uh, and another thing I really value about your, about your work is the way you, you refuse text. It's, um, it's demand in a kind of Anglo-American, North American tradition, this idea that text is the centre and the precondition of of theatre and I think resetting the framework to think instead about the spatial preconditions of performance is really exciting. I think that's true. I just, I was just reading, I, I, I just started reading finally Bill Worthen's book about drama that's about mm. 10 years old now and one of the first things he says is that Shakespeare is the worst thing that happened to English language theatre and also one of the best things. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I think that's true. I think there's, I think there's, there's uh, partly because of Shakespeare there's, and, and, and Shakespeare's status as a poet as well as a playwright, um, I think there, there, there's just a very long uh, tradition both in, the, in the, the theatre world but also in the scholarly world of thinking of theatre as through, through the text rather than through bodies and spaces. 
and you, you're, you're right, it might, be, it might be because of my own biographical background that I'm, I'm differently predisposed. And I, I tend to think of, of Bodies in Space as the first theatrical um, given. And those bodies can then speak or not, but that's yeah. not where it begins. Yeah, which I think is incredibly exciting. And again, with early modern drama, we often think of mm. plays starting with text, whereas I suspect most plays start with design decisions. Um, Decisions around spectacle. Um, uh, uh, so te text is a response to previous ideas, at the very least, that are happening with the author, with the company potentially, etc. Um, yes. So yes, not leading from the words that we happen to have, I think, is a really important way to think about early modern plays. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, it's partly partly just for commercial reasons. If you think about it, and a company has a stock of costumes, they have a space, probably at least by the time Shakespeare arrives in London, um, mm. they have they have a certain number of bodies <laughs> that they will want to utilize as effective as, as efficiently as possible, mm. um, um, and they might already have some texts yeah. that, that that they're no longer performing, or uh, or maybe a library of of. Of, of texts that that I'm sort of thinking of what Lucy um, Munro has written about this a bit, like the idea that there might be a, a, a company library that that playwrights can draw on. But they all these so those are the givens, and then um, I think that already constrains and enables particular kinds of writing. But but the writing doesn't come. Yeah, I don't think the writing comes first. I don't think the writing is, is sort of on. Uh, on spec, right? Like it's, sort of, it's actually targeted writing for, for a specific context that is not literary and, and not textual in nature, primarily at least. Thank you, that's exciting. Um, and so talking of the spatial preconditions of theatre, one of the big things that has changed in the last couple of weeks is that we have discovered, I, I want to say that we've discovered a red lion, as if it's just an animal that we found under the ground mm -hmm. that to be red. Um, but uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, it was announced um, that the Red Lion Playhouse uh, may have been found. Can I invite you to tell us a little bit about both what the Red Lion is or was and it, the significance of that discovery? Yeah, so the Red Lion is the first, it's not actually the first playing space we know about, the earlier um, spaces that were constructed um, or changed for the purpose of play acting, but the red line is sort of the first. The is is the first thing that scholars have <laughs> regularly described as the first playhouse um, or the first playing space, the first purpose-built playing space. And I know this is a phrase that you yourself um, have, have have gone to battle with. <laughs> But the, uh, it's something like that. It's, it's some kind of structure um, that was built for the per with the intent of staging performances there. Yeah. Um, in 1567, um, a bank wrote by John Brain, who um, becomes uh, James Burbage's um, brother-in-law and, and, and therefore one of the sort of founding figures of, of, of the English uh, commercial theater world. Um, we can talk a bit more about that in a minute. But the, so brain, brain. Uh, we know that brain had this thing constructed. Um, we know from two lawsuits, basically, which is all the documents we have about this uh, place, that uh, it had something described as a stage, uh, which was very large, um, and and some kind of scaffolds um, to sit on. Scaffolds or galleries is what the documents call them. Uh, and there were some problems with the carpent the two carpenters who constructed both of those things, and because of those problems, we know that they existed. We also know that the stage has a, had a very strange thing that's described, I think, as a turret that is quite quite tall and has something weird on top, that like a little room on top, and then I think the some sort of brace, um, and no one knows what this is. Um, so. Now, now that space, it was, in, it was uh, to the east of the city of London. Um, we didn't know exactly where, but somewhere around uh, contemporary Whitechapel, I think. Uh, so that's all we knew. Uh, and, and, and we knew that a play about Samson was supposed to be staged there. Which, now, is, which is my favorite fact, because that must be a play about a building falling down, right? I love, I love, I love that idea. <laughs> probably, yeah, probably. Um, so now the narrative had always been, 
that a this thing was this thing was built and it was mainly the, it was probably there for only a brief time and then brain lost interest and i actually don't know why we've always thought that because there's no documentation about this yeah. um now what has been dug up and actually not they've re announced this now but i gather they actually found it last year which is sort of like that, uh, uh, clearly, like the gossip circles in archaeology and theater history aren't working <laughs> at the moment. Because like, I would have thought this was was going to be big news the moment they found it. There are such strict confidentiality agreements with clients around archaeology that these ah. things these things are much more watertight than our world, Holger. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> because there are millions of pounds, multi millions of pounds involved. Oh, because it would delay potential buildings and. So, and change marketing strategies and things like that, probably, right? Yeah, I don't actually yeah. know why, because not, not all clients are like this, but yeah. uh, I, they, they often can be. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, cut. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that's interesting. We love the gossip. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> um, so, the, now, now it, the, what was announced a few weeks ago was that um, during an archaeological dig for the build, preceding the building of a new high rise um the uh, some sort of foundation uh, was discovered that matches the dimensions that we know the red lion stage had pretty exactly um and it's it's i think 30 by actually let me let me, let me double check this so i get the details right it's yeah it's 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 about um 12 by 9 meters which is very very large it's the largest stage in the entire period that we know of yeah um so that, those foundations were found, and and that's more exciting, actually, to my mind than that. Uh, surrounding the foundations of that stage, um, they found post holes, um, which um, indicate that some kind of gallery structure existed mm. um, that was about 30 meters um, long and 15 meters wide. Um, which means two things. Uh, it's A, this is actually a fairly, a fairly large space. Um, it sounds quite permanent, um, if, if, uh, and, and it's a, a rectangular space. Yeah. Um, none of those things we knew before. We didn't know that that stage had foundations at all. They're not mentioned, as far as I know, in the lawsuits. It, what's unusual is that the foundations aren't brick. Like for all the other um, playhouses um, that, that have been unearthed, uh, the foundations were made of brick. In this case, it's a timber foundation. Mm. Uh, and I don't know what that means. I, I, I don't know if that's because of the soil in that area, that that was enough. I don't know if it might, maybe, maybe the intention was to have this as a relatively temporary structure, but then it turned out to work and stood there for much, much longer. Um, the fact that all those things survive suggests to me that this structure stood there for quite a long time. Um, and presumably served some kind of purpose similar to um, the purpose it was built for. We don't know if it, if it continued to function as a performance space or yeah. uh, if, it, if it became something like an animal baiting area or, or whatever, but it, but it really it, it retained its shape for a fairly long time. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the first thing that I find fascinating about this, that it's um, uh, that... It, uh, that, that it might suggest that Brain, the, 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 the bankroller, in fact, didn't lose interest, but kept this thing running, um, which means that nine years later, when he and James Burbage together built the theater, well, Brain, this might actually be Brain's second venture, and the, uh, the red line might still be going at that point. Like, we have no idea whether that's the case or not. Yeah. Um, we just know nothing about it. Um, so that's that. That to me is is is, is that that's a paradigm shifting mm. um, consideration. Um, the other thing that's really fascinating to me, and this we'll, we'll need to talk about the curtain to enlarge this point a bit more, but is that the 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 outline of of the red lion as it ha seems to have been discovered is well, it's elongated. Right, it's it's twice as long as it is wide, mm. and it seems, if I understand what I've learned on Twitter from the archaeologists who dug it up, if I understand that evidence correctly, the the gallery that is facing the stage is deeper than the galleries on the side. This is you're not just driving the red line, right? Yes, yes, in the red line. Now. That makes it sound 
a lot like the uh, like an outdoor version, assuming it didn't have a roof. And I think we'd probably know if it had. Um, it, it sounds like an outdoor version of the Hotel de Bourgogne in mm -hmm. Paris, which you know is is the first <laughs> is the first building in post Roman Europe that gets built in order to stage plays in 1548, um, which I mean, it, had a, it had a roof, it was modeled on tennis courts, but it had a very similar structure to, to what the Red Lion seems to look like, namely a fairly large stage, gal na na relatively narrow galleries on the side. Hey, let, me, let me pause for a second. And <laughs> Don't you worry. We're, we're happy to have other contributors. <laughs> Yeah. We can still hear you, it's all right. <laughs> all right, I think he's calmed down. Okay, so the Hotel de Bourgogne. Um, relatively narrow galleries on the side. Um, a, a steep um, gallery at the, facing the stage with, with a stepped gallery um, that's raised. Um, and then the parterre, so the, 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 the ground floor area, which is the equivalent of the English pit where people stand. Um, it, that's what the Red Lion sounds to me like. And of course, that would make sense, right? If you think about, well, if, if, you, if, you, want to, if you want to build a space for performing plays um, in England in the 1560s, what's your model? Do you actually have a model? Mm. Uh, and it's not inconceivable to me that some of the people who were interested in doing this sort of thing might have got the idea from traveling on the continent or speaking to someone who had traveled on the continent, speaking to, some, to French immigrants right, in London, uh, the same way that Shakespeare probably spoke to, to Venetian immigrants in the area of London called the Rialto when he wanted to learn about Venice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, this is not something that I, I mean, there's, there's been a little bit of theater historical scholarship that has, has suggested things like this, that there might have been an influence of European theater spaces on, um, on, on uh, English theater spaces. Yeah. Uh, but there is no, that, that's something that's been very much downplayed in the, in, in the scholarship that has been dominant in the last couple of decades. Frank Hildy is pretty much the only one who's taken this seriously. Yeah, um, and so I think the Red Lion adds to a building an, an, an increasing body of evidence that we, I think, need to think about mm. theatre buildings in England as European theatre buildings. Mm. Which I guess maybe this is my post-Brexit <laughs> argument that actually this this world-beating theatre that, that we now hear about in England has deep roots in European theatre culture, um, at least on the spatial level. Absolutely, and the Curtain Playhouse doesn't look a million miles away from what's happening in Spain. Um, it Also in the 1570s, um, and I, yes. sh I share your anti-Brexit spirit, but I also wonder if there may be two-way dialogue going on. Um, uh, I mean, I'm particularly struck by the kind of Anglo-Spanish dialogue happening during um, Mary I's reign, um, when England and Spain are effectively part, potentially part of, this, um, of this, the same empire, certainly part of huge, hugely kind of renewed um, dialogue. Um, and it also raises questions about where playhouses sit in a kind of merchandising community, um, because you've got people swapping stuff. You referred to the Red Lion as a thing earlier, and merchants are swapping <laughs> stuff. And in, you know, as your French and your English merchants exchange stuff, they may well also be asking about how to monetize things, um, one, one of which is, is essentially a, a playhouse. So there's all kinds of kind of cross-European dialogue that could be in play here. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fascinating. I think that's, I think that's right. I think that's, a, I think that's sort of a nice broadening of the of the theatrical context into a larger cultural and economic sphere. Mm -hmm. um, the other way, you know, the other place to look is 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 um, modern day Poland. Um, there, mm -hmm. there. I mean, we know there's a there's a a, a playhouse that's built in Gdansk uh, that's rectangular uh, that was built ostensibly for the English players that regularly toured there. Um, 
And presumably the reason it looks the way it does is because that's what the English players wanted. Yeah. So there's a guy, so there's this sort of, and yes, I agree. I think, I think, I think the, um, the, the various Spanish theaters um, that, uh, um, and especially the surviving one um, in, in Almagro is, is, I mean, the one in Almagro is, is strikingly similar to, to the foundations of the curtain. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a bit unclear which um, which ways the the lines of influence might run there because the the um, the the um, what are they called the the the, the choral I think right in in yeah. Madrid is, is is a bit different from the ones in 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 Madrid for instance that that yeah. we have descriptions of but it is so similar to the curtain um, that it's it's kind of I, it is now impossible for me to not think of these spaces as related yeah. <laughs> Um, in a way, and, and this, I, I find this really fascinating because 10 years ago, before these discoveries, it would have been an extremely eccentric argument for an English theater historian to say that there is a strong connection between what theaters in England look like and what theaters on the continent look like. Mm -hmm. like that is not an argument people by and large made. And I think it is increasingly become an and becoming an argument that we actually have to make in order to understand what's going on in England. Yeah. And then we might actually think, and this is sort of, we, we, I'm, I'm jumping over the curtain, and I don't really want to, but the, the, but well, let me rephrase this. So the way the story of the English Playhouse has been told until very recently um, has always been about, has had the, the theater, the Playhouse called the theater at its heart. Um, and the theater is a polygonal space. Uh, but, but that's that's how it that that's how what we thought it was, and that's what archaeology has proven it to have been. Um, that space then, in subsequent his, in theater history, has become normative as the standard model of what an English playhouse looks like. Yep. and everything else um, has been described as some form of aberration or compromise or strangeness. <laughs> um, I think it is increasingly clear that the theater is the strangeness and that with the exception of maybe a 10-year period, it remained a strangeness. Mm. I can talk a bit more about that in a sec, but I think that we, we need to understand that the theater is the oddity. And once we've understood that, its name also makes sense. Yeah. Because it's not, a theater is not a playhouse, or a theater is a specific thing. What is a theater? It's a Roman thing. I mean, it's a Greek thing, but, but I think for, 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 for early modern English people yeah. of any kind of learning, it would have been a Roman thing. Well, and that's probably what it kind of looked like to the lay eye, and that it, had, it was sort of round, and, and it, was a bit like a, it was a bit like an amphitheater, like a, like a, like a Roman theater, like mm -hmm. a Colosseum or a space like that. Um, a space not built primarily for the performance of plays, but who knew that? Um, so so, so the, the name of the theater, in a way, should alert us to the fact that not only is it an innovation in 1576 for a playhouse to look like this, the name highlights that fact. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that name highlights its exceptional status and its abidingly exceptional status, which the globe then picks up by also telling us, hello, I'm round. Right? <laughs> um, now, when I say that it's only a 10-year period, it, it is that. So 1576, the, we know the theater gets built. Mm -hmm. The curtain has always been, or conventionally been described as built after that. We have no idea if that's true. Mm -hmm. um, the, the curtain might have been built a few years before the theater, and the curtain is rectangular, almost square. Um, after that, the rose gets built about a decade after the theater, and seems to look an awful lot like it. Mm. Like from the foundations, it looks like it's, it, it's almost a copy of the theater, mm. which of course, in a way is, now that's, that's Henslow building the rose. And that particular idea of Henslow looking at a theater that has something to do with the Burbage family <laughs> and going like, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not a one-off. <laughs> he does the same thing again around 1600, when he and Edward Allen built the Fortune Playhouse yep. in North London, where the contract for the building constantly refers to the globe as a model. So it's like, the Burbages build a new theater, Hensler wants, another, wants something similar, if different. Um, so the Rose is sort of modeled on the theater. 
So those are your two polygonal playhouses. Yeah. Um, then the swan gets built, and that's the only other polygonal playhouse, who, the polygonal shape of which um, seems to be based on nothing but, I don't know, fashion or, or a trend. Um, because after that, after 1590, mm. um, around then, the only other roundish theater spaces that get built are the globe, which isn't round because they wanted it to be round. It's round because it needed to be, because they were reusing the timbers of the theater. And, and it's a whole bunch of short timbers. I think it would have been much more difficult to construct a rectangular building out of those than to construct an, a, a, another so, sort of polygonal building. Yeah, less efficient. Less efficient. It's the second globe, which is a rebuilding of the old globe, slightly different, slightly enlarged, slightly fancied up, but on the same or modified found foundations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's the hope, which is conceived as a multi-purpose space, also designed as a baiting area, mm -hmm. arena. And baiting arenas, as far as I know, have always been polygonal because you don't want those bears to get trapped in corners. <laughs> so um, so other than, other than the swan and the rose, um, the swan and the rose are basically the only polygonal spaces um, that, are, that are polygonal because, out of choice. The theater, the swan and the rose. And they're built within 15 years of each other. Yeah. Or thereabouts. And that's a fad. Every other theater building built between indoor or outdoor, built between 15, 16, 7, 67, and the 1620s is rectangular. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think, and, and now that we know this because of the curtain dig and because of now the red lion dig, um, now that we know this, I think we have to change the narrative. We have to say, well, that's the normative model. Things like the in yards, that's normal. <laughs> They're yeah. rectangular. Yeah, that's because most playing spaces were. Mm. Um, the, the, the fact that the, that the Fortune Theater in, in Playhouse in 1601, 1600, 1601, when that gets built, um, in, and which in terms of interior design is modeled on the globe, in terms of fanc fanciness, it's modeled on the globe. But in terms of shape, it isn't at all, even though Alan and Henslow had a blank slate to play with. Mm. And they had an empty plot. Now you can say for other spaces, um, so for instance, the Red Lion seems to be built using the walls of a farmyard. Yeah. Right? So as part of its structure, which helps. Right? It, it means you don't need a strong foundation. You can attach the galleries to existing walls and so on. Um, that's also true of other playhouses. That's true, that's true of, the, of the Boar's Head. Um, in the late 1590s, that's probably true of the curtain in the 1570s, that it repurposes some pre-existing buildings and then attaches, it, it attaches itself to them. Um, it's, 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 it's probably true of, of the Red Bull. So there's like it, other, many other theaters or playhouses that get built, outdoor playhouses that get built in the late Elizabethan and early Jacobean era, uh, era uh, um, are outgrowths of existing buildings. They're not conversions, I don't think, of those buildings. They just, they infill in a way. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they fill gaps in the urban fabric. Um, and they use the, the bits around those gaps as part of their structure. Um, and you could say, well, those are rectangular because that's the shape of the gap. Well, that's not true of the fortune. The fortune is built on an empty lot. And, and Henslow and Allen make the decision to have it as a square building. Mm -hmm. In doing that, so until now, that's always been thought of, or that's the dominant narrative, that this is a departure from, from, the, from the dominant existing model. And I don't think it was. I think, I think it was a continuation of the longer history of playhouse building in, in London that goes back to the 1560s. Um, and the aberration are the theater, the globe, the swan, uh, the rose. Precisely the theatres which have come to serve as archetypes for how we now think of Elizabethan playing, e even to the point where we now reconstruct spaces yes. on that model. 
uh, yeah. so it's built very firmly into our into our contemporary dramaturgical reimaginings of Elizabethan and Jacobean playing. Yeah, and there's an added so the reconstruction element of this makes things even trickier. <laughs> um, not only, and I've been thinking, you know, if, if you look at the sort of the sort of illustrations we had of Elizabethan and Jacobean playhouses before the Globe, before Shakespeare's Globe was built, mm. um, they imagined very different spaces. Like we had these, and, and we had sort of competing narratives that were all equally hypothetical. We had this, the, you know, if you sort of look at look at look at the various models that were built in the like 1950s and 40s with those sort of um, uh, um, stages that were that that tapered towards the front and weren't rectangular, um, with uh, tiring houses that were angled and not mm -hmm. a flat surface, um, with tiring houses that ex extended over two stories. Um, and that's, I think, partly reflects what the fortune contract tells us about the glazing, <laughs> that the, the tiring house has glazing. So that sounds like it has windows that presumably open over the stage mm -hmm. um, and, and so on. So the, if you look at those older drawings, those sort of older reconstruction efforts, they're much more imaginative than what we get now. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they're more speculative. What we now have is Shakespeare's Globe, and because it exists <laughs> as a real space, I think it has limited our imagination. Um, and I and I I I don't want to I don't, I don't want to dismiss. I really don't want to dismiss the the, the the globe as a theater. I love it as a theater, but as a theater historical project, I think it's a real problem. Um, and one of the problems with it is that it has that enormous stage that juts out into the yard. And this is sort of where the, the rectangularity thing has a real payoff for theater and for thinking about performance. So one of the ways, right, I mean, what I've been talking about is space. And you might say, well, what does that, why does that matter? Like, why, who cares whether a space was square or round or whatever? The, well, one of the things that I think does matter is that, and, and this is where we can, can, can come back to the curtain. Um, yeah. In the curtain, we have the foundation, the full foundations of the stage, and it is three times as wide as it is deep. Um, it is very, it, it's very wide, 14 meters, and, a, and less than five meters deep. There's very little space on the side of that stage. The tiring house seems, there seem to have been two tiring houses, i.e. the space where actors uh, go when they go off stage, where they where they get changed, where they where they hang out. The green room, uh, uh, the green rooms and the dressing rooms seem to have been on either side of the stage and underneath the stage, possibly, because um, there's very little space behind it. Yeah. Uh, so, in the curtain, I would wager that the stage, the the space behind the stage, where there probably was a balcony, wasn't used for 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 audiences at all. Uh, because you need to put your musicians and your and your 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 Juliets somewhere, um, so you need that balcony, and it's so narrow that you can't also put people there. So then you might have had a few high-paying customers in one or two galleries on the side of the stage, but there isn't much more room than that. Which is to say, the vast majority of your audience is in front of the stage, which which means this is not a thrust stage configuration at all. Yeah. Um, and I would argue the same is true in the rows. Mm -hmm. If you look at the rows outline, and I've done this experiment with students. I have, our, our rehearsal hall, thankfully, happens to be as wide and a little wider than the curtain stage. So I've taped out the rows stage, the original rows stage in our rehearsal hall. You can fit about four people or maybe five people in the corners in the yard where the, that the stage extends wow. into. It's not a thrust stage. Mm. It's a frontal configuration with a few people in the galleries on the side. Because again, you need to have a tiring house somewhere. Yeah. You need to have a balcony somewhere because so many of the plays that we that survive require a balcony. Um, so the stage, Im the space immediately behind the stage. I don't know if there were any people there in any theater, but maybe, but at best, a few. So 
the vast majority of the audience in those spaces, and this must also have been true of the theater, because the, if, the, if the rose is closely modeled on the theater, then the theater stage was similar to the rose stage, which yeah. means it also wasn't a thrust stage. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of running out of theater spaces that actually had a deep thrust, and we do not know. And this is where my argument about Shakespeare's Globe comes in. We do not know what the Globe stage was like. We have no idea. Yeah. Um, the, the stage in Shakespeare's Globe is modeled on the fortune stage, um, which is for a square building, which is a very different configuration from a round building. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, the, the sort of, and that I think really should change the way we think about the relationship between the audience and the players. Like this notion that the photos we love to reproduce from modern performances at the Globe, taken from the pit, where you have a player standing close to the edge of the stage and this sea of heads surrounding them, right? And you sort of, it looks like the player is floating in, in like, sort of, like a rock star on a sort of narrow thrust of walkway, right? And it looks yep. like they're sort of floating on top of the audience. I have no idea if that effect ever happened in the theater that, that Shakespeare and his contemporaries wrote for. Um, and in fact, the theater that those playwrights wrote for might have been much more like a proscenium configuration. This is all completely fascinating. So I'm just going to have a think about um, what we might do, <laughs> might do with some of these issues. I mean, I too, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the theory of the thrust stage, but also the language of the thrust stage. It's such a, <laughs> such a peculiar um, word and such a kind of verbal adjective as well. Um, <laughs> Because thrust implies sudden movement, I think, whereas actually a thrust stage is often a bit of a problem. I've, I've, I've thrust my stage, now what do I do with it? <laughs> um, you quite rightly suggest that the, the rose stage isn't as thrusty as we think it was, but one of the things that's fascinating about it is that Henslow tinkers with it, and even if it is slightly thrusty to start with, he sort of retracts its thrustiness, and he, he, he turns it into something closer to... Um, well, I don't want to say pretty much, but certainly something that's more kind of face on for the audience. And the same thing I think happened under the jurisdiction of Dominic John Gould at The Globe, um, who was the second artistic director. I didn't see every single show under his jurisdiction, but every production I saw tampered with the thrust stage in fascinating ways yeah. and seemed extremely bothered by the idea of the audience around the stage. I never once saw a production which allowed the audience to be free flowing around that stage. So I feel like, I mean, I, I want to defend the Globe, um, uh, as you say, a wonderful theatre, and it's done such extraordinary work, I think, um, for scholarship as well. But but in, as far as it is a practice as research kind of model, and it's showing us how um, performance might have worked in Shakespeare's time, I think it's um, the places in which its experiments haven't worked have been just as valuable and exciting, I would say. And the John Gould period for me was sort of a practice as research demonstration of how anxious performers and directors may feel about the very idea of a thrust stage. And yet, I want to also bring the Royal Shakespeare Company and its recent renovation of the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, and perhaps also the Blackfriars reconstruction in Virginia. Um, we've, we've quite strongly embedded the thrust stage, not just in um, kind of Elizabethan Jacobean tinted performance, but all three of those theatres have really important and wonderful um, centres which are training future scholars. And so there's a, there's a, the thrust stage has thrust itself <laughs> into the performance, but also the scholarly imagination of, of theatre. And what's so exciting, I think, about going back to the archaeological discoveries of the last 30 or 40 years is just how eccentric the, uh, our, our current concept of how Elizabethan theatres looked actually, actually is. Yeah, I agree. And it's, sort of, and it's, it's not just scholarship, and it's, it, and it's not even just performance in, in deliberately reconstructive spaces like, like, like the Globe or the, the, or the Blackfriars or the, the Sam Wanamaker. Um, like, I mean, you, you mentioned the RSC. So yeah, that, I mean, the, the, the reinvention of that space as a deep thrust, uh, I don't know, I mean, thrust obviously is a completely bizarre term, um, <laughs> as, a, as a deeply um, propulsive <laughs> stage. That's even worse. Totally ridiculous um, term. <laughs> um, 
but but it's not just the RSC, right? I mean, it's 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 also true um, transatlantically um, uh, at the Stratford Festival. The Stratford, the the, the Tyrone yeah. Guthrie's influence, basically, right? In these um, these various thrust stages, some of which have steps. Um, and, and that refers to an earlier notion of what uh, an, an earlier reconstruction efforts uh, that sort of imagined a, a, a built, built in steps and built in balconies mm -hmm. that sort of also thrust out and so on. Um, but the, the Tom Patterson Theatre at, at Stratford in, in, in Ontario um, has, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't even describe it as a thrust stage, it's a walkway, it's, it's a broad walkway. It's sort yeah. of like a, <laughs> it's, it's, like a, it's like a very broad tongue stage. <laughs> <laughs> that is sort of what it looks like. It's it's partly because it was built in an old ice hockey rink. Yeah. So the, um, but the like that idea that that Shakespeare the the spaces in which Shakespeare's plays come to the kind of life they were intended to have are spaces where the actors are surrounded by the audience on three sides and possibly four sides. Um, I think that's a really that's just not an idea that the archaeological evidence bears out. Mm -hmm. Like there's, in, in that, there's basically, I don't think there's any evidence that Shakespeare wrote for that kind of stage configuration until 1599. If we, I mean, since we don't know anything about the globe, we're then sort of free to speculate and kids, okay, well, maybe, maybe the stage that the, that the fortune contract describes, which is very large, mm -hmm. was actually the stage that they had in the globe and Shakespeare's globe is correct in that. Fine. If that's true, then plays starting with about Julius Caesar are written for a stage like that. And then maybe, maybe one thing to, we can now do is look, look back over um, the, the, the Elizabethan and Jacobean canon and the Shakespearean canon in particular and say, okay, well, see, is, can, we see, can we see a break in the dramaturgy mm -hmm. that occurs when the globe opens? Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's a bit similar to what, what like Bernard, people like Bernard Beckerman back in the day um, did. And we, maybe we can revisit that work and rethink, well, okay, so what's the, now that we have the evidence of what the spaces that Shakespeare began writing for were probably like, mm -hmm. and how the globe might have been different, um, and how the Blackfriars might have been more like those old spaces than the globe, yep. <laughs> um, yep. then are there differences? And I don't know the answer to that because uh, that work hasn't really been done yet. Um, or maybe not. And if there isn't a difference, does that suggest that we're wrong about the globe stage? <laughs> and can we look at some of the plays written for the fortune and see if those are different mm -hmm. in ways that we hadn't really um, considered or, yeah. or that in ways that we hadn't looked for um, because that is such a large stage? Mm. Um, yeah, so that it's a, it, I mean, I am, I am sort of, you know, as a, this is, a, we, we talked earlier about, about where I come from in my thinking about theater. And one of, one of the places I come from in my thinking about theater is the proscenium stage. That's what I grew up with. Um, I, it, it's, it's what my, it's where my, my heart as a, as a theater goer really lies. Like I, I, to me as a theater goer, the most exhilarating thing to experience in a theater is sitting in the stalls, sitting somewhere in like, I don't know, row five or so in the stalls, watching an actor perform close to the edge of the stage with, I don't know, 15, 20 meters of emptiness behind her. Because that, because that's the theater I grew up with. These sort of 19th century proscenium stages that aren't used as box sets anymore, but are allowed to function as empty space, as volume. Um, and that emptiness incredibly enhances the presence of the actor, the emptiness behind them. Mm -hmm. Whereas to me, the thrust stage, it's, it's nice, but it's so much less flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and, and it, it, um, so if we, if, and, and so I am, I, I've, 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 I've long struggled with the idea that this particular configuration is somehow the ideal that modern theater and especially modern stagings of, 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 of um, early modern English plays should strive for in order to connect to some kind of theatrical essence. Yeah. Um, so I'm very satisfied that the archeological evidence suggests that the experience of standing facing an actor like this, like face to face, mm. um, 
it might actually be more normative in Shakespeare's own time than the experience of an audience surrounding an actor. Um, the other thing that I think is really exciting about this is, again, theater historically speaking, what it allows us to, how it allows us to rethink the handful of illustrations of performances or something that looks like performance, um, uh, uh, how it allows us to rethink those. So say the Peachum drawing, which is right, like that, that illustration that seems to, uh, seems to be from Titus Andronicus. Yeah. Um, and also something like the, the late printed frontispieces of the, uh, for the Spanish tragedy, say, um, where the, the spatial logic that those images uh, create is uh, one of width, not of depth. Um, yeah. And, 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 right? I mean, in, in Spanish tragedy, there seems to be a sequence of events staged from left to right, um, uh, in, 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 uh, from right to left, I think. And, and, and similarly, in the Peachum drawing, all the actors are more or less on a line or sort of in a, sh in a, sh in a shallow arc like this. Um, uh, well, that's a staging that makes no sense in a, in a, in a, in, on a stage that is in the middle of the audience. It makes perfect sense at the curtain. And I can tell you this because I've restaged the Peachum drawing with, with second year acting students on that taped out um, curtain stage. And it works perfectly. Wow. Um, it works perfectly, and if you like, look at the entrances and exits that happen in that scene in Titus Andronicus, um, with Titus' sons leaving and who's left on stage, and the kinds of emptinesses that it creates, um, when suddenly Titus is basically alone with a bunch of goths, <laughs> um, th that aloneness of the yeah. single Roman general with a bunch of with a bunch of of, of, of barbarians um, is it, it's 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 it. it it works extremely well on a broad stage where, where the, those people are suddenly isolated in the middle of the stage um, yeah. in a way that I don't think it necessarily would on a, on a deeper stage. Maybe, well, I don't know. But, the, but the, the, so that width, the idea that, that Renaissance staging is primarily about width and about a, a frontal confrontation with the audience is something that we just haven't thought that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, there's been a few um, again, Fra Frank Hildy is someone who has, I think it was Frank Hildy who made a probably mistaken argument that the second, the half of, the, of, of a deep stage like the globe stage, like the modern globe stage, the half that is close to the tiring house is essentially unusable. <laughs> I don't think that's really true, but maybe it is. I mean, I think that, um, so, uh, but the, 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 but, but so the idea, but, so, but very few people have thought about, um, what it might mean to think about Shakespeare's theater uh, as, 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 as a, a performance art that functions on a narrow strip of stage yeah. and looks out at the, or looks at the audience rather than being um, in the midst of the audience. Yeah, which means that so much of how we think performatively and in our scholarship is about front and back rather than left and right. Um, and you mentioned Spanish tragedy, which has this com that completely ridiculous scene right towards the start where an army processes across the stage. Exactly yes. the sort of thing which doesn't make an awful lot of sense on a front and back oriented stage, but a left and right stage. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. I mean, in general, like the, 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 the action of crossing, which is so common in early modern drama, mm. right? Someone crossing the stage. Well, again, <laughs> if you think about the curtain, yeah, that makes perfect sense. If the tiring houses were on either side, mm. that's actually, I mean, just technically, that's probably something you need to think about as a playwright. If you can't, <laughs> just in terms of management of bodies, mm. if like actor X needs to be on the other side of the stage later on, well, then you need to create a cross. You need to get mm. them there. Um, and sure, they might be able to cross underneath the stage. But again, like the, 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 that lateral movement as a central element of, of early modern stagecraft is 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 something well it makes much more sense if 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 the if if entrances and exits exits aren't at the back but maybe on the side yeah. or at an angle right i mean the, in those old like those 1950s drawings with the strangely angled often very elaborate tiring house well again that gives you a lateral uh, that gives you an axis like yeah. here that you don't have in the modern globe, but that's completely flat. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the multi-purpose function of um, um, 
French theatre as well. And I think that's probably true of, of the early modern playhouses we're finding in the curtain space uh, is a fencing venue as well as a, as a theatre yeah. venue. And again, left and right, much more easy to read as an audience member if you're watching combat um, yeah. than, front, than front and back. Um, Holger, yeah. we're moving towards the close of the of our conversation. Tragically, I think we should have several sequels. Um, <laughs> do you mind if I finish um, the Red Lion portion of our conversation by asking you... Um, I mean, it sounds like the red line has confirmed where your brain was already going. And I guess I want to ask you, did the red line in any way um, surprise you or work against your understanding of Elizabethan theatre? Maybe that's it's, just a no. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's, kind, it's kind of a no, but I was really surprised. I have to admit, like my first response was like, oh God, no. They found the red lion. But what does that mean now? Like what? Um, because I just didn't think it would be there. Like, I, 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 I just assumed there was no way that survived mm. because I, I sort of bought the narrative that this was something that was built a temp, as a temporary structure and then brain lost interest. Mm. Um, so it's changed my mind to the extent that I, I've, I, guess, I guess I've always, I've always, but always for, for, for quite a few years now, I've wanted to insist that we, there's such an absence of evidence about the theater of this period that I think we need to assume that we have lost much more than uh, we have and, and uh, that we're ignorant of much more um, than what we know. Um, and so my working assumption has for quite a long time now been that A, there were more theater companies that we know of, there were more theater companies resident in London that we know of, um, that there were certainly way, way, way more plays than, than we have. Um, hardly news. Um, and, uh, Don't upset your dog, though. Your dog's furious about that. <laughs> the, 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 male, the, the, the male person just knocked on the door. That cannot, oh. that, cannot, that, cannot <laughs> that must not stand. Um, so, um, and finally, yeah, so that, that, that the, I think we have to assume that if we know that a theater existed, we have to assume that it was used <laughs> uh, and, 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 that, and that it was probably used to a fairly large extent for the performance of plays or similarly large scale performances rather than for clowns and, and fencing competitions and so on because... <laughs> Very furious little dog. I feel like I'm watching live animal baiting. <laughs> That's right. It is. I, I, I'm the bear, um, or maybe the bull. I don't know. The, but the, so the the um, the. Okay. So we we if since theaters kept getting built, we must assume that the existing theaters were being used for performance, because if they weren't, then why build more theaters? Mm. Right, a multi-purpose is, I'm, 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 I, I completely agree that not a single playhouse in London would have been used exclusively for the performance of plays, um, including the Globe, mm. right? Once the Blackfriars is open, and if it is true that Shakespeare's company performed in the Blackfriars, say, all winter long, or half the year, maybe all year, I have no idea, no one knows, um, what happens to the Globe? The Globe is not owned by the Kingsmen. Now, the Globe is owned by a consortium of people, including the Kingsmen. Mm. There's absolutely no way that that consortium of people keeps paying a lease um, in order to leave the building stand empty. Of course, things were happening at the Globe. There's just no way they weren't. Mm. And what were those things? I don't know. Probably other, maybe other theatrical performances, probably things like fencing and so on. Okay, so you have all these spaces that now, but you can do fencing, you can do clowning, you can do juggling in different venues. You don't need a playhouse with a tiring house and all the other sort of features, a large stage, like all the stuff that you, that you need or that you want in a playhouse once, once playhouses built from scratch start existing. So the fact that theaters or things like playhouses keep getting built must mean that there's theatrical activity in all the others already, because they're full. Otherwise, you could just reuse the old spaces. Mm. So now all that means to my mind is just that there's way, way, way more play acting happening in London 
than we have documented evidence for. There's just no other way. Mm. Um, and that means that probably you have companies, even in Jacobean London, that don't have royal patronage of any kind. Um, some of which are probably documented not at all. Some of which we know, probably know from the read records as what we think of as regional companies, but they probably came to London too. Mm. Um, right? So there's, I think there's just, so that's my, and I think the, the thing that shifts with the discovery of the Red Lion is that I now think, well, this probably started much earlier than we thought. Um, and that when the decision was made to build the theater in 1576, that wasn't um, a Hail Mary, but it was, a, it was a sound business decision based on the fact that other spaces, including the inns and maybe including the curtain and maybe including the Red Lion, were doing good business and were full of paying customers. And therefore it made sense to invest the fairly substantial amount of money that it cost to build the theater. Um, which required loans, right? So you don't do that unless you're either crazy, which, you know, who knows, maybe James Burbage was, um, or, or you have a good reason to do it, which must, which must be that there is an existing yeah. business model for this. Yeah, right? the, theater, the theater as a response to an existing theater scene rather than something initiating and beginning. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I think that must be the case. Yeah. And, and the red line is part, the red line allows us to backdate that story or start yeah. that story earlier than I, and I must admit, I've been reluctant to do that. I, 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 I myself, I used, to, I, until a few weeks ago, I was, I was quite wedded to the idea that um, early modern theater, as we know it, as this thing that generates a huge demand for new plays, mm -hmm. um, uh, as, 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 as a, um, uh, 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 as, as an activity that generates uh, a newly invigorated literary genre, that that is something that doesn't happen until the 1570s. And I mm -hmm. think that might actually be wrong. I think it might just take a while for, for um, the market in, in play, for, 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 for the idea that plays are things you might also want to read uh, to catch on. And I think it then might mean that we have to think about it takes longer. Then it, it means it takes longer for people to figure out that plays are things that you might want to read than we used to think. We used to think that took about 20 years and maybe it actually took 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're referring there to printed plays, but it's sort of true of the evidence yeah. in general, isn't it? It takes a while for the evidence to catch up with what's happening. Um, and I think my bias might be the other way around in that I'd be quite happy to think about the Playhouse movement as a mid-Tudor, early Elizabethan or even pre-Elizabethan. Um, concept. But Holger, you are le you're leading us nicely to my final question because you're, you're making us think about plays <laughs> as things in print that you might read. So um, as you know, we end these films by asking what the word literature means to you. Feel free to tell me instead what literature means to people reading a play in the 1580s. But um, yeah, where does that word sit in, in your vocabulary? I wouldn't presume to speak for 400 year old people. Um, We've been doing that I, for nearly an hour. <laughs> I know, but not quite like, you know, not about their feelings. Like that's, a, that's too personal. I, um, um, I think literature, someone else, I'm going to quote, and I forget who, I'm going to quote a previous, a previous interviewee okay. um, who, was, who was quoting um, my, my, my former supervisor, Marge Garber, and saying uh -huh. that literature, literature is, a, is, a, is a good term to think with, and I agree with that. I think, I think literature is something, I think, thinking of drama as literature is an angle, um, and I think it's a... Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an angle that is complementary to the theatrical perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is in some ways richer than the theatrical perspective. I think of literature as, um, as a mood, I guess. <laughs> I, mean, I think, I th I think any, uh, literature is something to me, and this is obviously a question that, that, that theoreticians have been debating for centuries, right? Like, yeah. But the, 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 I, th I think the literary, as far as I'm concerned, is a, is, is the effect of an attitude, um, of, of a mode of attention, um, and of a mode of attention that has to do with a kind of leisure and a kind of a sense of time that the theater doesn't generally have. Hmm. Um, a hmm. theater, literature allows you to pause and ponder and dig. Um, theater presses on. 
<laughs> Even when it stands still, it doesn't yeah. really, it doesn't rewind. Theater generally doesn't rewind. It can, but then it's sort of a very highlighted, marked gesture. With yeah. literature, I think, has it built into its DNA that you can go back and forth and, 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 and fight against the linear pull of page one to a hundred by going back to page five after having reached page 10. And that's, you have that freedom. Um, and you've always had that freedom, even in a scroll, <laughs> um, because you have the object in your hand. Mm. Objecthood. Literature has something to do with objecthood. It, it, mm. it literature is tethered, I guess, to an object, whereas um, drama as performance is, incorp is incorporated and embodied, but not accessible as an object. <laughs> Yeah, or a different kind of object, I guess, and a different kind of leisure. Um, but yeah, I really like that answer. Thank you very much, Holger. Um, talking of leisure, I think we should release our listeners. But thank you very, very much for your incredible thoughts. I still can't believe they found a lion in the ground just hanging out. I think that's amazing. Uh, I was very excited to hear from your dog as well as from yourself. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So, cool. Take care.